Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. And welcome, welcome, welcome out to Shirley. And, um, it's been a crazy morning, so I'm certainly glad to be here. Uh, it's going to be a, a very good day today, very good morning. Now, a lot will be happening, videos and such things, so uh, we're excited. Now, it is Sanctity of Life Sunday, so today we're going to have a, just a wonderful, wonderful speaker come up here today, and we are very excited to have him, uh, and, and I am serious about that very thing. I love Brother Andy, and he has been such a blessing to us. He's an absolutely wonderful teacher. And uh, we certainly are blessed to have him here. I'm going to bring him up and let him get us started this morning. And we'll be excited to get going. Brother Andy, if you would, let him know you love him, church. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andy. I am a, a patient advocate at Comfort Care, a male mentor, as they call us. Um, we're going to see a, a short video here uh, regarding Comfort Care. And then I'm going to speak uh, just for a couple minutes after that. So if we could, if we could play that video. provides a safe place to do that with people who are going to love you and encourage you um, and love you no matter what and that's important the community every community needs that so and I don't know uh, that there is any other um, organization out there that does that for for our area so it helps people like me who don't know what direction they want to go in and it can be extremely difficult and feel like you have no one and when I went there, I felt like I had someone to support me no matter what I wanted to do. I think I might have ended up making a different decision. If I had gone somewhere that didn't give me all the information that I had asked for, I might have made an uninformed one or just one on a split decision. With the help of Comfort Care, I was able to make the decision to keep the baby. You know, I had thought about, you know, giving my baby up for adoption, maybe foster care, those other options. Um, but because of comfort care, I was assured that, you know, I could do this. Without comfort care, I don't know where I would be as far as, you know, stuff that I never thought about, that I think about now because you guys mentioned it to me. You know, it's stuff like that.
you know, when you're facing an unplanned pregnancy, if you feel like you have no support, no way to deal with this situation, then you you have to have people who are going to be willing to come alongside you and help you carry that burden. And um, otherwise, you're not going to be able to do it. So for me, I think that's what we do at Comfort Care. You know, we come alongside and we say, hey, we love you and we don't judge you and we'll help you. We'll help you carry that burden. And we kind of give them that first start out of the gate and, you know, and then, and then other people come in and, you know, they get their footing and they get their support system going and then they're able to keep going. So I think we're kind of that, that initial um, support system there that carries them through that first part until they can get their footing and they can get what they need and get that foundation under them and then they can, they can move forward. He's definitely the light of my life. <laughs> Definitely. I made the right call. <laughs> saw at the beginning of this video, uh, there is just a very short time from a woman finding out she's unexpectedly pregnant until she has to negotiate and, and make a decision about that. So the time frame is very critical to the work going on at Comfort Care, and we are trying to get the word out about the mere fact that Comfort Care exists, and it is there to help them get support, uh, with hope, and help, and as Lisa said, in a uh, non-judgmental, uh, safe environment uh, and it is it, it does exist there to help each woman get a foundation as she navigates a life-altering decision uh, you also heard from two of the recent patients um, as comfort care helped them uh, navigate towards their journey in motherhood both those both those ladies chose to chose life and they were they kept the babies that they were carrying uh, unfortunately uh, that outcome is not always the case, as we know. Uh, many women who come through the doors of comfort care are o absolutely overwhelmed with so much fear and from truly difficult circumstances um, that they seem to think that abortion is their only choice. Um, we're here to share the love of Christ and to show them that there are other options. Uh, the mission, here is the mission of comfort care. It seeks to offer information and resources to give women and even men a chance to make decisions grounded on truth and love as opposed to fear and societal pressures that is the great battle truth and love versus fear and societal pressure and while we hope that you celebrate these stories with us um, we are not done uh, comfort care continues because abortions continue and this debate in our society continues and so that caring and healing is necessary and we're here today to encourage you to support the, the women and women, the men and women in this, in this community that need the services of comfort care. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you're asking yourself now, uh, what can I do to get involved? And there are several things you can do today. Uh, as a Christian, as a child of God, you can pray for the ministry of comfort care. And there is a, a, what we call the 1212 prayer network. It's after Romans 1212. And that notifies you about uh, up-to-date prayer requests, uh, joining in, uh, uh, rejoicing about answered prayers, and praying for specific needs of the ministry. And as a Christian, as a saved person, that is, that is up to us. Who else is going to be praying for these women? It is only God's children. The second thing is, you can volunteer. I'm living proof that a trained monkey can work in this ministry. Okay? <laughs> You can be a patient advocate. You can be a receptionist. Uh, they're looking for nurses and sonographers in all of three locations of comfort care. And there's event support opportunities throughout the year, um, administrative support for the fundraising teams. Um, in addition, there's some of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. There are people who like to work behind the curtain, and, and that's jobs like stuffing envelopes, cleaning, and uh, even mowing the grass. And as you know, 
things don't just happen. When you see pastor up here preaching, the song service, uh, every things don't just happen. There's a lot of behind the scenes support. So there's many opportunities to serve. And there will be lots of information at the display table in the back. Uh, I'll be back there after the service. My wonderful submissive wife will be back there to with me as well and to show you different ways you can get involved. The third thing, and I think most of you saw this when you came in, is the baby bottles, okay? That, that is the traditional, the traditional monetary drive for comfort care. And it is, takes the form in baby bottles. Um, we are in over 90 churches in this area right now, okay? And a baby bottle doesn't seem like a lot. However, it raises approximately $65,000. That's not for bottle, but sixty-five thousand dollars total uh, for these in these ninety churches, um, and that provides the free services. These are free services they talked about here to countless men and women this year. So please pick up a baby bottle and fill it with change, cash, or checks. Mostly cash or checks. But thank you. As unto the Lord, is all I can all I can encourage you to do. So as a we are, we are uh, on the undisputably, inarguably correct side of a very divisive issue in our society today. We, we are. We stand on the correct side. It is inarguable. There, there is no debate. There is right and there is not right. So just prayerfully and thoughtfully consider how you might get involved in this ministry today. Prayer, volunteering, and financial support. And I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Steve, you have done a good job training the monkey, ain't you? Good job. Well, um, I, I will go ahead and say for our for our folks, today will be a day that we'll deal with a very very difficult issue of, of abortion. So, if you have a child, you're not certain that will uh, want to or you want them to hear some of the things we're talking about today. I want you, I want to give you this opportunity not to be mad or frustrated. Um, it's not going to be something I'm going to be jumping up down and running on the chairs. Um, because it's, it's, it's too difficult of a situation uh, for me to do that. I know it's kind of hard for, for you to understand, but I, I, I do try to think things through and I do want to show the love of Christ in all situations and things. So, you know, there's times when I can I can let it rip and, and just let the Holy Spirit run. And today, the Holy Spirit is going to be free. And just, but we are going to talk about a very difficult issue. So, first, let's, let's think just a minute. She said on the video, a place that they can be loved and not judged. Friend, there is a time to judge sin and there is a time to pray for and love over those who are dealing with these things. Uh, we all know that. If, if we never make a judgment on sin, nobody ever gets saved. All right? So if you don't look at someone and say, I love you, but I can see you're living in the world, and you never go to them and offer a, a, an alternative no one will ever come to know Jesus Christ as Lord outside of hearing a pastor preach. Now, we all understand that, uh, honestly, a lot happens in the church, but there is more ministry outside the church than there will ever be inside the church. Amen? It's important. We must go out and tell them and talk with them and, and deal with these things, not be afraid of them. So, there is a time to, to talk to them and honestly witness to In your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. So Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. I have to... Uh, well, Mike. It's dead in the hand. Here. Here you go. Um, you can bring it up for me. Did you find that link... Or the video? I didn't find it. Well, I think I did. Okay. I'm not sure. Well, just don't put up Popeye or something. Yeah, we'll well. Yeah. All right. Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. So, <clears throat> let me get there. I know I should have been there. All right, follow along. And God said, 
Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So we want to go to sanctity of life. What is sanctity of life? First off, yes, it, it, it does go into uh, abortion and euthanism. There's many things. So this Sunday is not just about abortion. This Sunday covers uh, the phrase sanctity of life. It reflects a belief that because people are made in the image of God, and the Bible is very specific about it, and the Bible sets us above all other life forms. Okay, Okay. so uh, there is a difference, and, and I'm not trying to get in trouble here, but there is a difference between human life and an animal's life. Amen? Okay. I know that's hard for animal lovers, but and I'm not, you know, you do your thing, and, and I'm not going to go there, so... But just remember, human life is more important because we've been made in this very image. So, and it sets us apart from all other life forms. And, and we have thumbs, all right? So that gets us too. That helps us out. All right. So Genesis chapter 3, chapter 9, verse 3 says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Boy, the Peter folks hate this one, amen? Get a phone call on that one, amen? Here we go. So, even as green herbs and all the things. So, we have been placed upon uh, overall. There is a special place for the human life. It should be uh, sanctified or set apart. It is different. We have been given the authority by God to go and, and to, to kill animals for the uh, consumption and for us to eat. And we are to rule over them. We are not to mistreat animals. All right? No one should ever mistreat an animal, period. All right? If you can't take good care of one, don't get one. All right? So you must, you need to take good care. That is part of just being a, a good Christian, a good moral person, friends. So you should take good care of your animals if you have some. It says, in verse 6, Whosoever shed, or whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall he. Uh, shall his blood be shed for the image of God made he man. So this absolutely sets apart the, the consequences for killing man. For killing animals are, are given for us, for the consumption, for God's, he likes them, he, in, he made them, it is God's creation. But if you kill a person, that is for you at that point for your life to be given. Now you can, you know, deal with. There's political issues here, and, and so many things that follows around this and follow suit. But friends, listen. The Bible instructs us: if you kill someone, your life should be given. Now, I, I am a firm believer in these things. All right. So, I, I've got a, a three-day rule through life. All right. You fool me once, the old shame on you. Uh, I'm not real quick on those things, so they'll normally fool me twice. Or shame on me, shame on you. A third time, whatever it is, I don't even know what the thing says. What is it? Fool me once. Shame on me. Fool. Fool me once, shame on you. Twice, shame on you. Okay. Fool me a third time, shame on me again. All right. Shame on you again. I don't know who it is. All right. Somebody ought to be shamed over over here. So I'm just not. I don't, you know I'm not. That is something that's not in my. Uh, my DNA, really. My wife is very good at that, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But I will tell you this. Come third time, friend, I will love you, but it'll be from a distance. All right? And I'll be there for you. But I'm not just going to stand there and let you use me as a doormat. All right? That's not what God has asked us to do. I'm not going to enable you. I, I will be there for you. But I will cut you off, friend, and I will just be there as a pastor, and I'll love on you. Now, I got kind of got that that, that three day rule with when it comes to someone taking another's life. If you've seen them, it's an eyewitness. There is no doubt. I think it's three days. You send them home. 
You give them a day to get things right with their family, a day to get right with the Lord. You give them a good steak dinner on the third day before, send them home. That's right. <laughs> Saves us a whole lot of money, amen? amen. So, and I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to say something out there. But listen, this is crazy. We are too far into this thing as we've gone so far away. But now, murdering folks is absolutely expressly forbidden because humanity is built in, created in the image of God. It is set apart and set above all other life forms. So, now, as humans, though, we are not set apart because we are an inherently good. Amen? Now, everybody's sitting here going, no, I'm not saying amen to that. <laughs> I promise you, we weren't set apart because of who we are and what we do, and we're so much better. If we're honest, I think a herd of elephants take better care of each other than we do, if we're being honest, all right? You know, we are out here killing each other left and right. There is no true sanctity or respect for human life anymore. So we are given this sanctity and set apart because we are what? Built in and created in the image of God. His goodness is all that's good in you and I. And I know we don't like to admit that, but if you were left to your own devices with no consequences, would you be here today? Let's be honest. At some point, you came to a knowledge of the fact, if I continue like this, I will die and go straight to hell. Right? Amen? Because if not, we are inherently evil and we would just continue on the road we're on because there's no consequences for sin. Now, that's not true. We know that and understand that now. So, there is a sanctity. A, there is a difference in human life. We must understand we are not set apart because of our goodness, but because of His greatness. So, humanity is, you know, we are more sacred than the, le the rest of them. Uh, the rest of human life. So, the... The Sunday or the sanctity of human life is not just about abortion, but it's about so many other things that can come into play. It's about respect of human life. It's about uh, holding each other at a higher, uh, at a, a level of, of rule number two love your neighbor as yourself. See, that's the sanctity of life. Now, I, I know that's difficult for us, but we should. Be, we should look down upon violence and abuse, oppression. We should look down on, on human trafficking and any and other and all evils that exist in the world we are in today that are, that are t taking or lessening the value of human life. That's sanctity of life. That's what today's about. So it's not just one thing, but it's about many things that open our eyes just a little bit. Now, we've had sanctity of life, and we've recognized this for many, many years. I've never really stopped. We've talked about it at different points. But today, we are go a little bit more involved with it. You're going to see a lot of slides. I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as possible. But at the same time, it's an information day that I don't want us to be unaware. Right? That is just ignorance is no excuse. And if you are ignorant to what's happening... That is, that is my fault. I'm one of the ones that will be held accountable for that. So I want to make sure that you understand what we're talking about. And we're going to talk about the issue of divorce and what the Bible says. Now, Matthew 22, 37 uh, says this. Jesus said unto him, now this is Jesus speaking. This is important. There uh, Thank you. And he said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and thy mind. And this is the first commandment. Here we go. Rule number two. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. <laughs> On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is what sanctity of life is all about. Our actions need to be motivated for our love for humankind and for one another. It's not to be because I have to, but we need to be motivated for the love of our neighbor. We need to be motivated because God loved us when we were unlovable. You may have a neighbor that is horrible. Right? You just cannot seem to like this guy or this woman. Every time your dog goes over there, they shoot him with a BB gun. You say, I can't stand it. Every time the, the leaves blow off your tree into their yard, they complain. Uh, the trash or whatever it is. Listen, 
I understand that. We all understand we have neighbors that frustrate us. We all understand this is not easy. But where were you when God loved you? Oh, makes it a little easier to love your neighbor's dog, amen. My neighbor's chickens come over into my yard. And they were running them out. And I, I told them, I said, forget, them chickens eat mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. All right? So I didn't know that till this year. Well, my backyard's horrible. I mean, horrid, man. And they come over and eat the mosquitoes, and it started making a difference. So I was like, please, just mm -hmm. let them chickens get in the yard. I'm good. Don't run them out. You know? I got a big West Virginia sign that fits right in with who I am. Don't worry about it. Doesn't matter to me. I don't care. So, and then I got a little dog whose name is Bo. Bo likes the chickens as well. <laughs> but I don't know that it is uh, the love he has for the chickens is motivated by God. I think it's more motivated by his belly. Uh, so Bo cornered one of, my, one of the neighbor's chickens the other day. And I couldn't get him to come in. I didn't know what happened. So I just I let him out and had stuff to do. I'm doing. I'm calling for him. and he's, I've really been working with him. He's pretty good. And I call, he comes. So... I called, called, called. He would not come. I go around the corner and he runs over to me. He's got chicken feathers all over him. I hope my neighbor's not watching. If you are, brother, I am sorry. I really am. I'm going to tell you about this as soon as I see you. Okay, so I haven't told my neighbor. <laughs> and if it's Jason watching, don't tell our other neighbor over there, all right? So don't tell him. So, um... I never thought about that, huh? <laughs> Boy, you gotta love modern media. Boy, you just forget all kinds of good stuff, amen. So anyway, I might as well tell this story during now. So here we go. Bo got the, the he runs over to me like to say, hot dog. I got a new play toy. Feathers everywhere. I'm like, oh no. He runs back over. He's got this chicken buried in to this big tall pompous grass. And I thought, oh dear heavens. He's done. Because he had feathers everywhere. I seen evidently where the capture had taken place and there was feathers everywhere. And I thought, there's no way this poor chicken's alive. So I took him inside and I waited and I prayed for about 20, 20 30 minutes. All right? I was like, Lord, please, just don't let the chicken be dead. I was like, I, you know, if he's hurt, I'll glue the feathers back on, whatever. I've got to do, but don't let the chicken be dead. Well... Anyway, so I get there, and, and I wait, and I go back out, and the chicken won't move. I thought, oh, it's done. It's over. Here I am. i got to take this dead chicken. And this is not a normal chicken. This is a chicken that's got like a poof of hair up here. This isn't a normal. And his feet are real puffy. So I'm like, this is going to cost me a small fortune. It's probably a $10,000 chicken or something. So... I'm worried. That's really the reason I have more to do it. That and he's still alive. All right, this is a good thing. Now we get to the good point. So the poofy chicken really looks bad now. So his feet are poofy, his head's poofy, but everything else is pretty scarce. All right. So I'm like, oh dear heavens, here we are. So I go and I get, I go to reach in, and he starts clucking, and I'm like, oh, thank you, Lord. Now I reach in, and of course he flies off, and then you should have seen it was on. He can't get over the thing. So I'm chasing this little white puppy chicken, and he's got no feathers on him, and I got gloves, and me and him are wrestling around in the pompous grass. Finally, I come out, and, and, and I videoed it just so we, you, I can show it to somebody afterwards because it is funny. And I just threw him down on the ground, and I thought, let's just see if he'll run, and he run a little bit. Can't get back over the gate. Then I got to chase him down. You got the fat man running up and down chasing the little puffy chicken. It was horrendous, all right? So I was scarred for life. I had no reason, I no idea why I went into this story. See, that's the bad thing with me and stories, because I don't know why I tell these stories from time to time. What was I talking about before the chicken? The sanctity of life, okay. I don't know how I was bringing that into, oh, we got to love each other, and, and my dog's not necessarily uh, motivated by the love of God, all right? Your love for your neighbor may not be motivated by the love of God. But friend, you need to love your neighbor. You need to allow God to motivate you. All right? Not just because you don't like them. We need to go beyond that. That's Bible. We all understand this. Okay. Galatians and Colossians teach us 
that we need to love and absolutely care for His people. So, we need to protect. And we are good about protecting each other from the stuff that we see on a normal basis, this sickness and murder. and We try to do those things, but then sometimes there are things that happen that we don't know how to handle. Right? And that's what's happened in the church. How many of you here have heard a pastor stand up and preach a sermon on abortion? That's our problem. All right? Before I ever done a sermon on uh, and preached on and have been opened up about depression, how many of you have heard a sermon outside of this church on depression? There's our problem. See, we're not talking about these things in church. We're not instructing people on in how to go what the Bible says. So how do we know? We think it's a personal opinion. In fact, the Bible teaches us these things. So that's what I want to do today. Uh, now, what does the Bible say about abortion? I could go on, uh, to be honest, I'll tell you this, it doesn't specifically, it never says abortion is a sin. But that happens in the New Testament a lot. What it does say, and it goes, and it's not, like Andy said, there is no left, right, or, or moving on this. It's very specific in what the Bible says about life and human life. So although it may not say abortion, it does talk about life. Jeremiah 1 5. Before I was before I formed thee in your belly, I knew thee. And before thou cometh forth out of the womb, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Now he's speaking to Jeremiah and this the prophet that is to come, but as well he is speaking to the fact of before Jeremiah was ever born, he had formed him. He knew him. And he was a living thing while still in the belly. Amen. So, it doesn't say abortion, but the Bible teaches us that human life in the belly of a woman, in the womb, is still life. Amen. Now, let's go to... Psalm 139. And verses, and if you don't get these, you can just jot down the, the references to them if you want them. And if not, I'll give them to you afterwards or we'll make it available. 139, 14 through 16. Thank you for making me. Now, this is, I want to, oh, wait a minute. I need to hear a video. All right. No, I don't either. I got to turn to it. Sorry. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. Get that video ready, brother. We'll be there in just a minute. All right. So, I meant... Did I put Proverbs? Oh, no, Psalm. I was going to say, it looks off. Psalms 139. Mm -hmm. I didn't mark this one for us. So, let me do some reading now. All right. Psalm 139. 13 through 16. Is that right? 14. I'm going to read 13 because it applies. I highlighted it here. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me... In my mother's womb, I will praise you. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from you, from thee, when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see me, or see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in the book all my members were written, which I can my which in countenance were fashioned, and when as yet there was none or of them. Now I'm going to read it a little bit easier to read. If uh, bring that thing back up on my Psalm 139 there. I know you're getting the video ready. I'm making it tough on Mike back here today. Let's read it. Just, let's just break this thing down to just so that we can talk through it. Sometimes it's not as easy to understand, so I want to just talk through it. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. We can say that about all women. Women are beautifully complex. Amen. So, and you, apart from the Word of God, you have no hope of understanding your wife. We all understand that, right? All right. It'd be an act of God. That's what it takes. All right. Now, I'm not saying that badly, women. 
Again, you are beautifully complex. All right. I think that's a pretty good statement right there. Amen. It's a good way to put it. All right. So, see, I heard one amen come from over here. One woman. All right. One woman here. All right. Your workmanship is marvelous. And how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter reclusion or seclusion as I was woven together in the darkness of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Man, is that good or what? Amen? Amen. Listen, folks, this is good stuff. Amen? That's good preaching, whether it's me or not. This is good preaching. The Word spells it out for us so that we understand that what is happening and what's going on and how precious human life is to the Creator. So it's important for us to understand how precious it is. Now, the Bible. We see now, and, it, and I can give you many more throughout. So it continues on. Humanity, human life is very, very important. And the taking of human life in the womb is not something God approves of. And I know that's hard. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to get to the statement that she made in just a moment. One of the first questions that comes out, what about rape or incest? That's a good question. Because then, we are looking at it and going, oh my. First off, we have to remember it's not that when, when God ran across this for the first time, He went, whew, never thought of that. Didn't see that coming? He had already thought this through. All right, let's make sure. Where we are, He's already been. Where we are going, He's already been there. He's after, before, right now. He always has been, always will be. Now, He understood this. When He began writing and breathing the Word to the writers of this, he began, uh, he knew what was coming. So, I don't want to lessen facts, but a lot of facts are given that I really, truly, am, I just don't believe they're true. So let me tell you, when it comes to rape or incest, only five-tenths of one percent of all rapes that ever, rapes that ever occur are rape, or, or I'm sorry, of all the abortions that ever occur come from rape or incest. Now, I'm giving you high-end numbers because I don't... These are the higher ends of the things that I found because I don't want to... The numbers, I, I can just give to you on the high ends of them. There's all kinds of other things, but I, I'm just going to give you kind of the higher. Some have said one-tenth of one percent. There's a lot of things. But now you say, my goodness. Let's think about this. So, we have... In the United States, since Roe versus Wade in 1973, there have been 60 million abortions. Mm -hmm. 60 million are here in the United States. That's it. That's tw over 2,500 abortions a day in the United States of America. That's a hard one to swallow. Mm -hmm. A five tenths of one percent, that's a lot of children. That's a very difficult circumstance very difficult. But let me tell you some good things about this. This is something we can celebrate. In 85% of those cases in, that were brought to them of rape or incest, 85% of the women chose to keep the baby over abortion. Amen? Amen. That's good stuff right there. We should. That is fantastic. Now, we want to see 100, but what it's showing us Women love their children and they want to be a good mother and they want to inherently keep their children but they feel like they're just all alone. We've seen this. And they don't know where to turn. And they're afraid to come to the church because we don't talk about it. So we have to become a place where our our little slogan is a place where friends become family. This must become a place where people are loved. 
No matter what the issue is going on, they know that they can come here and that they will be loved and that we will share this with them and help them through it. Amen? We need to, the church has to become this. And in, and in order to, for us to become this type of a church, we must talk about it. You have to be informed. Another good thing is since 1991. See, we don't hear this, and we should be. Somebody needs to be talking about some of these things. Since 1991, the heyday of abortions was in the middle, uh, middle 80s, or from like 82 up to 91. That's when it skyrocketed. So we all are in the, this kind of mind thought that, or thought process that it's this new generation. These kids just don't know. That's not true. Since 1991, abortions have been on a steady decline every year. Thank the Lord. So we have seen a, seen a decline every year. So it's coming down, but it's, it's not where we want it to be. We are still seeing over 650,000 abortions in America every year. But at one point, it was 1.4 million. That's a lot. It's a lot of decline. We're excited about that, but we got a long ways to go. Now, it's horrible that any woman would have to go through rape or incest. That should never happen in any society across the entire world. It's just, honestly, it's unthinkable. It should never happen. But it does. Two wrongs don't make a right. See, that, how do we handle it when we say, okay, you know what, we're going to go ahead and take the baby? Friends, that's tough. That baby has another thing. And I know it's difficult. But the Word of God says we must understand that that baby in that womb has been created by the Almighty. He's built in the image of God. So it makes it hard. But it doesn't make it any less true. Now I want to see a video here. Out of, uh, the first uh, video from HLI.org. This is a woman who um, was going to have, or well, I'll let her talk. Let's we'll see if this is the right woman. Oh. If it comes up, Popeye, it's not it. He really thought that we would have children right away once we got married. No, but go ahead. But as things went on, that was just not happening, and it was devastating. It was challenging, uh, but over time, we finally were able to conceive, and we were thrilled. When I saw that little line, there are no words to describe it. Fast forward to my 22 week ultrasound. So I'm lying on the table and the tech is, you know, moving the little ultrasound wand around with the gel on my stomach. And she very politely says to me, um, I need to excuse myself and go get a doctor. And a doctor in the practice that day, she said to me, your baby must not have any kidneys. Your baby must not have a bladder. Half your amniotic fluid is gone. There must be something chromosomally wrong with your baby. You need to have an abortion. You could die, and your baby most certainly will die. That was jarring. Uh, that was a life-changing moment. Of course, we loved our child, and we wanted to know what hopeful steps we were going to be given next, or some direction. That doctor sent us up to another doctor, and this actually was even more disturbing because this doctor that my husband and I sat across from, he was very calm and collected, he said, you, you clearly need to have an abortion. You'll have many other children. And I so vividly remember saying, I don't care if we have a hundred other children. This life matters, and we want this life. And he said, but you don't understand. Your child probably won't even weigh. Your child clearly has a chromosomal abnormality that is not compatible with life. There's no way that this child would live. And if for some reason this child did live, this child would have no quality of life. And finally, as we were getting toward the end of the conversation, my husband said, clearly, we are not going to abort. 
So what will you do for us? What can we expect? And he said the most chilling words. He said, in my seven years of practice, nobody in your position has ever not aborted. We asked him if there were other tests he could do. He said, the only other test I could offer you is an autopsy report. And he went on to say, go home and wait for your baby to die. And when you come back in for one of your visits, there will no longer be a heartbeat and you will give birth to a stillborn child. At which point, my wonderful husband and I went home. Devastated. Devastated, honestly wanting to shut ourselves away from the world and just devastated. And my amazing mom, she said, Suzanne, is there still a heartbeat? And I said, well, yes. She said, Suzanne, if there's a heartbeat, there is hope. We reached out to a doctor in our church. And he said, we'll honor your request to fight for your baby's life. And immediately they put me on bed rest rushed into the operating room, and it was an emergency C-section. And they said, because there's no amniotic fluid, if by chance she is alive, she will be too weak to cry. And there was a, a drape. My husband could see on the other side, I couldn't. And then I remember seeing Rachel come up out up over the top of that sheet, and she was very tiny. I all of a sudden heard him say, she's squawking, and the doctors were joking because they said, she's so feisty and willful, she kept sticking her hands up trying to grab the doctor's stethoscope, and they thought she would be too weak to cry, they thought she would be too weak to move. It was something I'll never forget, and you can't really put words to it either. All I kept thinking was, she's alive. God says, I knit you together uh, in your mother's womb. So God knew her before we did and had value in her. And if we didn't know God or that verse, I can't imagine how that would have changed our perspectives. My name is Rachel Mary and if my parents wouldn't have fought for me, I would have missed out on a life that is such a joy. You know, that's why I say this isn't an easy issue. This is not for us to be able to just simply look at and say, all right, we got this. You know, we got to talk through it. We got to be supportive. We got to be there for one another. So, we see here a mother at risk, a child at risk, a woman who chose life, a woman who placed her faith and hope in Christ. So, I know it's difficult, and as you go through, we have to make tough decisions. Life isn't easy. The video that I was going to show was specifically a woman that had been raped and she was pregnant and they were telling her you know let's just go ahead and have an abortion and she said no that's that's off the table I'm not even thinking about it and she said you know that the question or the the thought process is if I have an abortion you know at this because of what it was that it will help her you know consciously to, to not have to deal with this day in and day out and the woman's perspective was if I hadn't had this baby I couldn't deal with this day in and day out because the only thing good that come from this was that little girl that is tough see these things are difficult and 
we have to talk about them and we have to be open about them. Um, you know, we look at abortion and truly, well, as far as rape and incest, we know that that's a very, uh, very small portion. There's only about 7% in abortions of abortions today that are done that actually entail uh, medical problems for mom or baby. It's a low number. And only 1% or less than 1% of those are life-threatening. And we say, I've said all of that to say abortion should never be the first option. Mm -hmm. The problem is we don't have a medical field that's agreeing with this. And we have a whole, we're split on this. This is a big issue in America. We got a lot of people saying, listen, you know, it's okay. Don't worry about it. It'll help you. And, and the reality of it is, friends, you think about it. Could, ladies, could you live with that? You know, it'd be so hard. So I say, you know, all of these to say, I'm not trying to be insensitive. And I don't want to come across like that. And I pray that I'm not. But I say this so that we understand where we are. The issues are difficult, but we are also being fed a very bad bill of sale from today's media. Because they're only focusing on one or two little things, and honestly, those things can be, for the most part, uh, uh, taken away by, by doctors who care, inducing labor. They can induce early labor and, and, and miss a lot of the, the problems that may come for mom or adult. A C-section is another one where that removes a lot of the problems with those things. So we see that there are other ways. The youngest baby to live from a preterm pre labor, preterm birth, is 21 weeks and 5 days. Can you imagine? That baby didn't weigh a pound. Less than a pound. And that little baby has lived a full life. So we see that it is difficult. We know that this is hard. And this is a tough, tough situation. But what we have done is we just kind of say, you know what, it doesn't affect the church. That's not true. We've got a problem here. Because of those women who say that they have a religious affiliation, 43% of them identify themselves as Protestant. 27% Catholic, 13% of the women say that they are born-again believers. Mm. It's in the church. We don't know anything about it because we don't talk about it. Because we haven't given women a safe place to come. Let's be honest. Because in I know when I grew up, listen, you didn't talk about these things. You just didn't talk about it. If you were homosexual, you did not talk about these things. We're in a different generation where we must talk about these things. Because it's important for the generation coming after us. Remember, they are that why generation. They are the, don't just tell me, show me. Mm -hmm. And if we can't effectively show them what we believe, we're not going to communicate this to the next generation. But, this next generation coming, they understand, they have a greater understanding and believe more that babies are absolutely a human life. So we can say what we want about this generation, but friends, they're, they've come a long way. And we see this as the rate of abortions continue to go down. And we must continue to educate one another. We must in the church and everywhere else talk of, uh, must continue educating and learning. So it's important in the church. It's important outside of the church. Moms and dads, this is important for your children to understand what are going on. So it's not just outside of the church. Now, the biggest question, and I'm going to, I'm going to try to end it in just about 10 minutes, okay? So hang on, you're almost there. Bring up the baby center. If you would, the biggest question we're facing throughout uh, America is, when does life begin? Okay? Now, we've already heard and, and understand that, that the Word of God in the Bible teaches us that life begins in the womb, but we're not sure when. Go on up a little bit, brother. Can I? 
Can I hold that thing? I don't think I can, can I? Oh, it disappeared. I'm trying to make it bigger. Oh, okay. So, he's, life begins in the womb, but for us right now, we're, we're talking about what is, you know, what's happening. So I wanted you to get to see what happens kind of week by week for the first just six or seven weeks. That's all I'm looking for, okay? So we know that in the first couple of weeks, there's a lot going on as far as uh, the, the egg being fertilized and things happening. Uh, so there you go. Can you scroll up? Is it, or have you made that bigger? I need the explanations on the other page so they can see them. You're going to have to go back one more. Because it, it talks about what happens to them and on that page. I didn't write them down because it teaches us. At about five weeks, the baby gets a heartbeat and a heart. A boy. That is difficult. Now, move that up a little bit so I can see uh, the, the picture a little better, Mike. Oh, the tail's gone. Did you know he had a tail at one point? Yeah. I didn't even know that. I know I, I don't look at these things really. I don't, I don't. So I, I go in and start studying, and I'm, and I'm looking at that going, well, there's Andy. <laughs> Andy was a well-trained monkey. I was like, there he is. He's got a tail and everything. So it, it falls <laughs> off, and, and here we are five weeks. The heart begins to develop, and there becomes a heartbeat. Now that's difficult. You know, and that's at five weeks. So as we move on, let's go, I think it shows the next one. Go to about six or seven weeks. So I'm asking a lot of Mike back here today on this. Uh, I wish it was as easy. We could just scroll up and hit buttons, but we, we're not there yet. We'll get there in a minute. Um, so they continue to develop, and it's important for us now, here, look, look at there. No, we hadn't lost it yet. You can see the spinal cord, heart's beating, blood's beginning to pump. You can see the veins through the baby. Now, what does it say, Mike, just above it? All right, here's what it explains. It says, uh, of all, all a flutter, your baby's heart has started beating about 160 times a minute. Now, I can get that 160 times a minute when mom sets a plate of gravy down on the table, right? The <laughs> problem is it shouldn't be 160 times a minute because the gravy has got it way up there. But ha morning sickness has kicked in. You know, tips on how to keep it, uh, or uh, how to keep it at bay. Uh, it, it's just interesting. Bleeding, it talks about bleeding can now be normal. And it just continues and continues on as the baby grows. I know this is difficult, and we're all not going to agree. In this house, the honest truth is we would not all agree on when the baby is a baby and it's formed and when is it is. Can we do this? Can we not do this? So what I want to do is give you information today. And I want you to understand that you know, it, it is possible at a very young age for these babies to make it. It is a difficult, difficult decision. All right, you know, what, what week is that, Mike? Eight. Eight weeks. Got a little smile on his face. <laughs> See an eye, hands are starting to form. That's at eight weeks. <coughs> I truly believe that if women were giving <laughs> options, and could see what's going on in their belly. If they knew that they, that they are fearfully and wonderfully made and this little baby is made in the image of God, I just think it couldn't help, but it, it's got to help us. So I, we need organizations who are out there and telling us. We need for us to be able to, to go and talk to them but our people around us need a place, a safe place they can come and talk and not be judged. Amen. That needs to be the church. <coughs> Friends, we, we've swept this thing under the rug. We don't talk about it. That's, that's all gone. 
we need to be a part of this comfort care. Is, no. Yes, okay. I, I never get that name right. So comfort care. Uh, we need to be a part of a part of the solution, not part of the problem. We need to be there. And listen, not every time is someone going to make the decision you and I make. But when they don't, we don't throw them out with the trash. We are not going to be the church that says, hey, listen, we're done. I'm sorry. This is not the sin uh, that you, that you uh, unforgivable sin. This isn't it, friends. This is a difficult decision that we must understand that women, many women make without ever knowing the truth, what's going on and consequences and understanding. And we need to make sure that we are the church that can sit there with them and say, honey, I love you. And I'll be here for you. And we will be there for you. We're not going to judge you in this. We're going to try to help you through this. There is a time to judge. And there is a time to love. And we better make sure we know the difference because we're sure hurting a lot of people because we're judging them instead of loving them. What do we always say? You make them feel welcome. You love them when they come through the, through the door. The Word of God will convict them of what's going on in their life. If you do your job and I do my job, God's got this. He, we've just given us a part of it. So we must understand and encourage one another and encourage in this that there is a time when we must seek you first. We must seek with all of your heart that we must uh, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and, and, and lean not upon your understanding or don't lean upon what I am feel like I am wise in, but place our faith and trust and acknowledge Him. And we need to be part of the, the solution and not the problem. Church, I know this is difficult. You probably didn't come here today thinking this was going to be your message today. But we need to know. We need to be uh, aware of. And we need to make sure that uh, we are helping out. Not just financially. Uh, financial is important. Listen, you all, you all know this. We, the church doesn't run if you don't give. Uh, we close the doors and it becomes a community center. That's exactly what happens. So uh, if we're not a part of Helping educate these women, it'll never change. We have to be a part of it. So, I'm not just saying our local, it'd be a great place to start, but we also must know what we're talking about. We have to be able to love them beyond. And we have to know exactly what the Word of God says. Now, everybody, this is as quiet as I have ever heard this congregation. Everybody is sitting here right now going, Oh my. God's got this. We have to trust in Him. But we also need to know what the Word of God says. For them little babies, they are that. They're little babies. They were important to God and they were important to us. But not the same decision will be made all the time. And we need to understand this is difficult. This is not something that just goes, it's not a fly-by-night decision. But as we heard, it's made very, very quickly. So we need to make sure that we are a church that are being there, that people can trust and think that I can go to my pastor, I can go to my church, and they will listen to what I've got to say and they will help encourage me along the way. Amen? Amen. I love you. I thank you. Let's stand to your feet if you would. I know this has been different.